worried about us. So that's kind of, you know, where the book goes and, and that's it. So I was just really confused and unhappy thinking about this and thinking about how, you know, the, you know, how someone could say, oh, there's gender identity politics here and we don't want these in schools. And it, just, it was just troubling to me. And I, I couldn't believe that people were hating on books like this one because it's about acceptance. It's about empathy. It's about kindness, individuality, respect, all this good stuff that I want, you know, that I want my kids to be aware of and to know about and to learn and grow. Um, so I bought this book and I put it on my bookshelf. I started bringing home other books um, that I heard had been banned. Another another one we really have liked is um, Jill Twisses, A Day in the Life of Marlon Bundo. Another really great story about, um, and cute and funny story about Mike Pence's uh, family bunny that finds lo finding love with another male bunny at the White House. It's so cute. And my kids just adore that book. Um, so really, um, we, we love these books in our home and we love not just these, but others that have been targeted for, for truth telling about police violence or otherwise sharing viewpoints of people identified as, uh, minorities. And so, and we live in, you know, our, our small town is pretty conservative. So in our community, what, our, my kids are exposed to in the community can be somewhat limited, but not in the library, you know, not in the library and not in, on our bookshelves. Um, so I want, I want my children to know that they're just right, whoever they are. Um, I want them to see themselves in books like I've had the privilege of doing throughout my life. And I also want them to be able to stand up to the bullies. Um, I want them to stand up for other kids who are being bullied for being different. Um, and I really believe, it, and in my experience, books have the, can have this um, incredible impact on shaping our worldviews, and I don't want that uh, opportunity removed for any child. Um, so um, that is to say that Banned Books Box, we're sending out mostly adult books, YA um, books, honestly, um, not exactly the picture books or the middle grade books like the ones um, we, that I'm talking about, that I've talked about so far, um, that just has to do with, you know, logistics and, and manpower more than anything else. Help someday that we could do a, uh, a children's box. But what we're doing right now is um, moving out, moving books out to readers who care about just social, social justice. Um, that's, I think that, you know, it's, it's helping to give adults tools that they need to be on the right side of the battle. And then we've also been able to do some cool stuff with authors of banned books. Um, we were able to make this uh, zine with Ashley Hope Perez. So you may, you, you probably are familiar with, with Out of Dark, her book, Out of Darkness. That's, you know, on the, the top 10 most challenged books list for 2021. Um, she wrote this zine, zine. I always, <laughs> it's like my, in my head, I say zine, and then I have to remember to say zine when I'm saying it out loud. Um, but she wrote this. Um, it's take, it says taking a stand for youth access to diverse literature in the face of book banning. So she's got, you know, her story and some really cool suggestions about how she's handled and, and handles, handled book bans and, and her book. Um, specifically, and it's just a great resource we've been able to get out to people. Um, we've also had the opportunity to work with Maya Kobe, um, the author of Gender Queer, which you probably are familiar with as well, um, the number one book on the most challenged list of 2021. Um, and he, he created the design for this pen that we used in that book, which is, this is the pen that Maya Kobe designed um, to go with that pen. And so we're, I mean, to go with the, the book in that box. So we just, I just feel really lucky to be able to have been able to facilitate getting this stuff out in the world more, you know, and being on that, you know, the, the side of the fight 
that is about spreading the light. Um, we support authors, we support books, and we support readers. And we try to just stay out of the, the dark place thinking about, you know, book bans where we feel really, you know, where I'm feeling really alien and disheartening because sometimes, I mean, when I'm, when I'm going down that road, I'm, I'm thinking about how just how ridiculous and absurd and how I want to fight with people. And um, so this is, I, I could talk more about that, but I won't, I won't go all the way on that. That's that soapbox right now. Um, there, there are tons and tons of good resources out there, though, of how to, um, you know, without getting stuck in that, the, the dark place of like, oh, this is just, you know, this is just awful. And what kind of world do we have? But really, you know, true good resources of how to, you know, how to handle um, book bans in your community and how to stand up. Um, and I think in the chat, Molly, you mentioned red wine and blue. Oh, they have a great campaign, the Book Ban Busters, that has a lot of, they have training, book ban troublemaker trainings. Those have been great. Um, and a lot of resources associated with that. A, a new, I think they call it a playbook, came out recently. That's really cool. I don't know if there's any red wine, red wine and blue people here. Um, so and yeah, I, I'll, I'll kind of stop Carol, there. Just jump in what, one thing with red, wine, and blue. They have a really cool map that you can zoom into, find what's going on in your state, your area, your region, and how to get involved. So I like yeah. that it's um, not just sort of a campaign, but it's actual, here's how to, how to have a voice and how to be an advocate. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's great. They're, they have great resources. Um, so I think, I, I think I'm going to kind of stop there and I'll, and jump back into the, the conversation at, one, at some point and you know, pass Ariel, it off to you, Molly. Ariel, quick question. Yeah. Are the books adult books, YA books or children's books or different, different months? Um, different, different months, but mostly, um, mostly YA, but adult. So kind of on, I, I, we've been sort of on that line the whole time just where YA books with adult interest you know everybody's different and why I why is a little bit gray sometimes so yeah but no not picture books at this time um well thank you so much I'm excited to hear from Joyce how ALA is dealing with this which obviously <laughs> sorry my dog is um looking for attention um this is the world that you live in all the time. So, um, and I um, encourage people to check out the chat if they are not already. So Joyce, I think you're co-host, but- uh, All right. All right, um, what's yours? I'll share, I'll, uh, first of all, um, Ariel, that's impressive. And that you're talking to authors and working with them and coming up with pins. What a neat and ambitious thing. Thank you. So, so cool. Um, I'm, I'm going to share a quick slide deck, uh, just a short one with about five slides to sort of explain what ALA and the Freedom to Read Foundation each do. Um, but I put in the chat, check out the website, Unite Against Book Bans. Unite Against Book Bans. Um, ALA launched that during uh, National Library Week last week and um, that's another great resource and spot to learn more about how you can help unite against book bans. Um, let me go ahead and just uh, share my screen here. Um, oh. Come on, there we go. Um, so I work with the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom and with the Freedom to Read Foundation. And I just wanna point out a few slides to help people understand the difference between the two groups. The American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom does support, challenge support and provides resources. And I can honestly say that my colleagues, Deborah and Kristen, are working with people across the country nonstop. We're working with public library staff on how to have your policies in place so that you can 
uh, help, you know, combat censorship. Um, and uh, they're working with school districts across the country and explaining to people how to, you know, basically how to do some grassroots activism um, and also how to work with the public to understand what's going on, to understand why it's not okay uh, to uh, ban books. Um, ALA also does education and advocacy. We do uh, Ban Books Week, the Intellectual Freedom Manual, lots of education. Um, and then we work with ALA entities like the Intellectual Freedom Roundtable, Intellectual Freedom Committees. Each of our states has a library association. Most of them have an Intellectual Freedom Committee. And so um, my colleagues at the Office for Intellectual Freedom work with the leaders in each state so that we understand what's happening, where it's happening. I think one of the most critical things though that I need to point out here is that if you go to ala.org slash OIF, you will find a button that says um, report challenges. There's also also a button for how to work through a challenge. Those are both wonderful resources for how to navigate challenges. But the key thing is if you are aware of a book or an item being challenged at all, please report it. You don't have to share your name. We're not going to get on the phone and say, where's this happening? Um, you can do it anonymously. It just helps us track. The, the top 10 lists that Ariel was referring to, we've kept that list for the last 20 years. And those challenges are the ones where we're understanding the dramatic statistics and the increase. And I'll, I'll share some statistics in a few minutes. Um, just the last year and now this year, we've seen more than we ever have in 20 years. Um, the Freedom to Read Foundation focuses on First Amendment, litigation, education, and advocacy. And you can see where we overlap with ALA on education and advocacy. The key difference here is that because we're a nonprofit, we can litigate. And so um, you don't often hear about this part because quite often, um, I'm thinking of Canton, Ohio, actually, right now, because my father's from there, but communities like Canton, small communities throughout the country, you know, you, you don't necessarily always want to say, hey, we've got people from ALA or we have attorneys from Washington coming in and helping us. We want to help people in those communities work through it with their local ACLU or their local attorney, or even just talk through it with parents and local boards. So we are helping with litigation, but quite often you aren't aware of that. Um, oh, I, I typed it into the chat, but I have to give a pitch for Unite Against Book Bans. I am very excited about this just because I think it'll be a great resource for people to have a sense of what's going on. Um, I always like to share my uh, definition of censorship, just so when I talk about it, we're on the same page. Um, and that's, that's it as far as slides. I just wanted to give that sort of organizational introduction. And I do want to say a few more things. Um, so it's interesting because I get asked a lot, well, well, you're a librarian and we're supposed to be neutral. And how can you, um, you know, how can you maintain neutrality? And I tell people, you don't have to be neutral. As librarians, what we do have to do is acknowledge First Amendment rights and we have to provide access to information as protected by the First Amendment. But 
as an organization, as a library, as an individual, we can have an identity of being anti-racist. We can have an identity of being for social justice. In fact, many of you, I'm about to preach to the choir and you already know this, uh, for those who aren't librarians, um, last year, the American Library Association added a ninth value to their code of ethics. For years and years and years, there were eight bullets under the code of ethics. But I just wanna to read to you what was added last year because I think it's a perfect one for this conversation and for this group. It says, we affirm the inherent dignity and rights of every person. We work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases, to confront inequity and oppression, to enhance diversity and inclusion, and to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, communities, profession, and associations through awareness, advocacy, education, collaboration, services, and allocation of resources and spaces. And I just love that that took place. And I like to remind people when I'm talking about this topic, that that truly is where librarians are coming from right now. Um, and I'm also, um, I also wanna share a little hope in the midst of some pretty awful statistics. So in 2021, there were 729 challenges to 1,597 materials. That's huge. A few years ago in the office, maybe in a month, I would see three to four reports of challenges come in. Um, and it's a drop in the bucket because most challenges don't get reported. Most of the time a patron walks up to the first person they see, tells them what they think of an item. You say, here's a materials challenge you know, form, feel free to fill it out. That is absolutely your right to express what, how you feel. And usually it just drops right there. But now we're seeing more and more but the encouraging statistics in, in the midst of all of this that's going on, um, recent polling showed that 74% of parents of public school children have a high degree of confidence in their school librarians and educators to make good choices about the books that are available to their kids. That 74% made me feel very good. And I wanna remind people that we're listening to a loud minority in these instances. Um, another poll uh, shared that, um, where's my statistics about the people who feel we should not ban books? I do not have that number, one moment. I don't have a number and I never quote numbers because I'm fairly dyslexic. Yes, I'm the dyslexic librarian, but I'm not going to give a wrong statistic. Um, <laughs> but a majority of people feel that we should not ban books. And I like to joke that have you ever seen someone on, you know, who's all for book banning come out on the right side of history? Not really. <laughs> if you think about it. Um, so anyways, I, I will note a less positive statistic and something that I'm sure you as an organization have approached and discussed um, is the fact that right now, the books that are being banned relate to, to race and to history of uh, race in our country and relate to LGBTQ content. And the chilling effect here is that one, 
all people deserve to see their life reflected in content. We have to protect access to that information. We are held to do that. Um, and the, when I say chilling effect, what concerns me is that for a librarian who doesn't feel supported by their staff or their leaders, sorry about that. I don't have a dog that's barking, but I do have a son who um, screeches some. Uh, um, we've got some literacy action going on here too in our home. Um, but by chilling effect, I, I feel like sometimes it becomes easier for a teacher who doesn't feel supported to say, I'm not going to buy that because I'm nervous that parents are going to disagree or my principal won't support me. Sometimes that public librarian is going to say, you know what, I'm not going to put this on a display. I don't want to draw attention to it. And even though that soft censorship, the concern is that then it's not really providing access. If someone can't see that, if someone doesn't have access to it or know to look for it. Um, so it's critical to help our educators, our trustees um, to know about intellectual freedom, to know about First Amendment and privacy rights, and to do everything we can in our profession to make sure that we're not censoring books and we're supporting those who are working hard to prevent censorship. So that may have been a slightly disjointed overview, but uh, that's a general info. And I certainly welcome people's questions or thoughts as we talk. Joyce, would you just pop up the definition again? that you had at the end of your PowerPoint. Yeah. Thank you. This one? Yes, I just wanted to snap a picture of it real quick. Thank you. Um, usually, I also put up uh, things like, uh, you know, intellectual freedom and some First Amendment rights, et cetera, but I thought I'd keep it simple. Um, well, so this has been such a cool balance of a sort of practitioner, meaning Ariel's work in the ground, on the ground, getting books out. And then Joyce's explanation from a larger, you know, macroscopic level of what's going on. And um, what I keep ruminating over is this loud majority, my, loud minority, which you're a hundred percent right. And um, feels like I mean, we've all heard the expression, the expression, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. How do we make it so that their volume isn't clouding the overarching message of the actual majority? So when I think about book banning, why now? And that's a large, larger political conversation, I think in many areas. Um, why now? And then the what next so how do we turn the volume down on them and um you know i i know that we are just a tiny tiny little um group of people who came together on a wednesday night to have these conversations and these conversations are happening all over the country in you know schools literacy advocates parents all of it um so how do we tap into that and i'm going to stop talking and let you guys talk did you want me to take an initial stab at that and then see what people think? Or I, that would be great. I'm tired. I'm tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> so you guys tell me your thoughts, your experiences. 
Um, I'd, I'd like to answer that on two fronts. I'd like to answer that in regards to public libraries. And then I'd like to answer that uh, in relation to what's happening with school districts across the country. So in public libraries, I find myself reminding uh, myself and others in public libraries that um, even though we are a limited public forum and therefore protected by the First Amendment and we have to protect our patrons' freedom of speech, we can create time, place, and manner policies that, um, that we are bound to. So we have a collection development policy and it states what we will purchase. And if a patron's like, why did you buy this? Well, you know what? If we have more than two holds, we buy X copies. If we buy books for every person, it is our job to provide access to information. We don't have to defend the content. It's not our job to defend content. So those collection development policies in the public library are critical. Our meeting room policies are important. Our patron behavior policies are important. And finally, when talking to people in public libraries, I remind them, we don't just make up our rules, right? Where, for example, we have to provide patron privacy. We can't tell everyone, who checked out genderqueer because our state's compiled statutes provide privacy for library patrons. So in public libraries, we are truly protected and we just need to be thoughtful about those policies and how they're written and why and make sure we're providing access. As I noted, we have to provide access for everyone. I used to purchase religion and politics for a library 20 miles west of Chicago in a more conservative county. And, uh, you know, people get upset because you're buying the religion and politics that they don't like. You know, everyone's got their side. And once in a while, I had to remind people that it's not the Republicans or the Democrats that are out there challenging books, it's extremists. And sometimes I tell you, I just saw the, well, but really it's not. Right now, since our last administration, there's a much heavier attack on the First Amendment. So right now, yes, you can say it's coming from this side, but if you look at book banning historically, it is an extreme activity. Um, and once again, we, we just have to provide access to information. At the library, you can still say, I support Black Lives Matter. You can still have a Pride Week exhibit. You can have an identity as supporting social justice. And that ninth code of ethics says you must. Now, in schools, it gets a little trickier because quite often our school boards weren't necessarily ready for this onslaught. And I tell people all of a sudden we're, we're understanding that small local elections are critical. You can't just go in there and check the first person you see, or I wanna vote for a woman, so I'm going to check this, or I wanna vote you know, in alphabetical order, you really have to know your candidates because decisions are being made at that low local level. And even though school boards weren't necessarily ready, they can certainly be educated. And I, I've been uh, working with a group of parents locally um, where I live because the same challenges have come to um, our high school uh, school board. There's a group called Turning Point USA that are coming to each of their meetings and trying to challenge books and a number of other policies. Um, 
So I talk about the fact that our educators and our officials aren't just throwing topics or book titles up in the air and grabbing what they want. They are choosing curriculum that they choose for a reason. People say, well, but it's, it's related to um, sexuality and our kindergartner shouldn't get this. And I tell them, no, and your kindergartner won't. Books, you need to look at how books are cataloged. You know, these books aren't being handed to your kindergartner. You're in a school system or a district where you've got five-year-olds and 18-year-olds. Quite often, the books that parents are saying can be harmful to minors are really for the, the older teens. And they're cataloged for them. And it's just a matter of reminding school board officials, oh, here's the list. This is the age it's cataloged for. This is where it's being used. It's appropriate. Um, the other thing I say, you know what, this is the time for grassroots organizing. If you know that five parents are going to show up from a group and they're going to suggest we ban some books, then you have 10 parents there who are going to get up and speak against banning and who are going to be supportive of the teachers and the administration. Um, so it really is the time for some grassroots organizing. Um, and I see Sarah's note here about anti-intellectual movement and it's like, yes. And they've got quite a grassroots campaign going on, so we need to have a bigger one. Um, Molly, did that kind of cover it, or? Yeah, I um, I was having a conversation with um, the middle grade author Jarrett Lerner, who, um, if you don't know Jarrett's work. He himself would say it is not the cream of the crop, lit like intellectual literary genius. He writes about farting robots and kids love him. And he, you are not gonna find anybody who is a bigger advocate of kids and books and literacy than Jarrett Lerner. I adore him. Um, he was, we had this interesting conversation about whether some of this work is trying to set, some of the book banning conversations are trying to set larger conversations for privatization of public education. And so that's another kind of interesting conversation to, that nobody knows and nobody has an answer to, but um, is sort of ruminating in the back of my mind. Well, I actually grew up in the same area as our last Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos. Uh, I'm a Michigander. Um, and the effect that she had on public schools and on schools in general, especially in Michigan before she was in her role, uh, is a bit alarming. Um, There's, yeah, that's possible. Um, there's a lot of that going on. That's really interesting. We're seeing some of that here in, I live in Virginia and um, our uh, newly elected governor, we, Virginia has off year elections. So our governor has been in office just for one legislative session, but he um, is, he and his ilk are working towards making it so that public education is not the education system for the Commonwealth that, you know, that, well, you know, other people can have other ideas and then the public money should go to that. And I think that this is all part of this pushing against professional educators that instead of instead of saying, oh, a, li a school librarian is trained and credentialed and educated in her field and therefore should be trusted to build a library collection. And a kindergarten teacher is trained and credentialed and educated in her field and she should be, or he or she should be uh, trusted to educate kindergartners. 
that there's this push that says, oh no, you know, the other people know better than our trained, educated, and credentialed professionals. And I think that we're seeing it not just in education, you know, we're seeing it in other aspects as well. And I think it's really, really dangerous. And to me, it seems to be that anti-intellectual and anti-professionalism piece seems to pull together some threads of from book banning and the push for school choice, which is a loaded term and the, you know, the fighting against public health officials and all of that to me has this one kind of common core um, that I think is really dangerous and frightening. Uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, the historian, uh, literacy historian, Harvey Graff, who works out of Ohio State University, he calls it the, the new illiteracy that, you know, the anti-intellectual, the anti-intellectual movement, I guess you would say. And, you know, I think what what you know we've been seeing and I, and I kind of alluded to earlier is like that we've been seeing that school districts you know have these policies in place um, for challenging materials and so and but groups you know like I hadn't heard of the turning point one that Joyce mentioned but uh, there are a number of of groups that you know have these united efforts where they have, you know, scripts for challenging materials and, um, you know, they're quite, they're, they're quite united, but they, they, they come in and, you know, when they are, when people are creating such an uproar about certain books, the schools, the, the administrators are like, just throwing their policies out the window. So I mean, I feel like the, that's what I read about so often. And, um, you know, they're, they have the, the policies in place. Like, I mean, and I love Joyce, how you're talking about the libraries, you know, about just the values of a, of a librarian, you know, and how you, um, you know, just, protect the access to ideas. I love that. Um, I think that, you know, I think school boards, you know, not being prepared, not being needing to refresh themselves on, you know, what their policies are for protecting, um, protecting ideas needs, maybe is, is starting to happen and more and more as over and over again, you know, parents come in and say, these books are, you know, this is terrible, this is obscene. And this, you know, administrators are like, oh, we better get it off the shelf while we check into it, which is like censorship. That's a book banning right there. Um, so it's, I'd like to see more school districts following their own, the policies they have in place to being refreshed on those and, and remembering like, you can't just do, you can't just, you're, you already, have an answer to this. I, I would also say that in addition to local school board elections and library board elections being important, we all go into the voting booth and see this long list of judges. That list is also important. And um, the thing I would note though, is that in a number of instances across the country, judges don't buy the whole harmful to minors um, argument. In fact, there are a number of arguments that these groups that are sharing the list of 20 books here or doing a FOIA there, um, quite often they're saying this is harmful to minors or now they're starting to say we're, we're launching a lawsuit against the school board quite often those are thrown out, um, which is good news. Um, it, it really is such a wake up call though for how we view local politics and the importance of those elections.
me read what Laura has written here. Yeah, Laura, I that's so true, and it's alarming. And um, what's a challenge is that um, you know they're throwing out phrases like critical race theory. Well, they're not they're not actually objecting to critical race theory. That's an entirely different beast. What they're saying is, I don't want history about people who aren't white shared or i don't want to face history um and, and i think that uh or they're saying we don't need or want um diversity education of any sort or our teachers don't need it but if you look at everything that's going on it's like no we we all desperately need it we have to find ways so that kids who are on book islands get books. So that kids who are black and brown and every other color have access to their history. Um, it's, uh, it is horrible, the messages that are out there and key is highlighting the authors that Ariel's highlighting. And the key is talking to people about providing access to this information and doing it in a nice, calm, moderate way. Um, that, that's the key is just explaining the law to people explaining some of these definitions to people, letting people know, um, my mother was a huge censor. She didn't let me watch Little House on the Prairie. She, I kid you not. She thought, you know, Laura and Nellie and all those adult topics apparently. But she knew that she had no business determining whether my neighbors across the street read Little House on the Prairie or watched it. I mean, that's the other key is to remind parents you absolutely, and that's a value in our public libraries that parents help their kids or caregivers help their kids determine what they're going to check out and read. They are responsible for that. And I, I tell fellow parents every day, it is absolutely your right to help your child choose what to read that reflects your family's values, but you do not have the right to tell anyone else. And that teacher's responsible for providing information for everybody. Um, I'm sorry, book desert. Uh, Amy, I, that was me with a misquote. Sorry about that. I, I used the word island instead of desert on that one. Um, Sarah, yes. Um, that's where it's important to, uh, to be aware of legislation that's going on, um, to reach out and make sure our lawmakers know how we feel to organize groups of parents or groups of local residents to reach out to their legislators and make sure that these bills don't pass. <laughs> yeah, because I have heard people talk about the parents right to control what their own kid reads, but not what everybody else's kid reads as a way to talk about book bans and censorship. And I think, and I, and I was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And then there was an, an author and I don't remember who it was who pointed out that, well, that's fine as long as the parents are responsible and the parents are accepting of their children, which we sadly know is not the case. 
And especially in a school library environment where kids have access to the school library without a parent bringing them to, to the library, right? You know, a 12-year-old is going to need a ride most of the time to the public library, but they have access at the school library juncture without their parents being involved. And it may be the only opportunity that those kids have to have access to books that reflect their lived experience. Um, and I, so I think we have to be careful about the idea that parents have all of the control um, in a school library environment, rather than the school librarian being trusted to shelve the right books for that school, you know, and the age groups that are served by that school, and then kids having access to the books that are in the school library. I just, I think we have to be careful about that. And about not leading something just because it hasn't checked out. That's a big one. Um, it's really easy to weed some of those books um, that haven't checked out in a while that uh, have LGBTQ content, but I'm sure there's plenty of people looking at those books, but some just not comfortable taking them home. Yeah, sitting in the stacks and reading them during lunch and then putting them back on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've got a question for Ariel, and I'm, I'm curious, who is purchasing the banned book boxes? I'm curious about sort of the demographic that's interested. I'm curious if you're working with Red Wine and Blue. What's, uh, I, I'm excited about what you're doing, but I'm curious about how you're getting the word out and who's reaching out to you? Who's, who's in on this? Yeah, I'm... Um, I don't have a fully clear view of who the demographic is. Honestly, I, I'm not asking for those, um, <laughs> uh, for a lot of statistics, you know, when, when people are signing up. So I don't have a fully, a full view, but I have a, some guesses. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I have just used the resources I know, you know, through social media to kind of get the word out. I sent out some so press releases and the, the, the Cleveland scene, you know, which is the alternative paper newspaper closest to me, they picked it up. And so I, I, my Ohio base sort of blew up of people who, you know, are read the, the Cleveland scene. And um, I have had some contact with, with red and wine and blue, and we're working on, you know, a plan to, to work together some more. Um, but uh, I, have linked up with the, a group called Honesty in Ohio Education, and that's helped get the word out some. So it's kind of just been a, a natural um, a natural progression. So I I think um, you know um, people who can afford books that's part of the demographic. People who can afford to buy books, um, and that's and you know, uh, some are buying gifts and others are just readers who, who care about social justice. So that's what I know. One thing that I have tried to do, I, I also happen to have a little free library. Um, and uh, my little free library is in a town near where I grew up in Southwest Michigan. And it's a town that there's two unique things about it. It's heavily a tourist town, um, but it's also a very segregated town. Like you can drive to one street and everyone south of that street pretty much is black. And then the rest of the town, well, it's fairly touristy and then not many people during the winter. And one thing that I have always tried to do is make sure that all the little free libraries in the town have books that um, uh, are by Black authors um, or represent Black history or have LGBTQ content. Um, at my church there, uh, we started a diverse bookshelf. 
Um, so there's anti-racism books, there's LGBTQ books, there's the how to be a perfect stranger in someone else's religion books. Just the importance of getting works by Black authors, getting works by authors in the queer community, getting their word out, but also making sure they get into people's hands is so important. Oh, neat, Laura, thank you for letting us uh, know that. Uh, Laura noted that she's also filling LFLs with the verse books. It, it's a great thing to do. Um, and Sarah talked about soft censorship, yeah. Would, I, I'd love to have other people kind of pitch in and let me know if you have some questions about what's happening with book challenges or what your experience is. Um, and just so you know, that I, Molly, thank you so much for um, inviting me because this is the first time I've become aware of your group. I, uh, I, I apologize for noting that I didn't, I wasn't aware of it at all. So thank you so much. I think Molly had a note a few minutes ago that she had to go pick up a, a child from sports practice. Oh, okay. So I bet she'll hear that thank you on the recording and appreciate it. <laughs> I did want to ask it. you though, and I had mentioned it in the chat earlier, like just how, how has the American Library Association kept up with challenges this past year? What has it been like being... I mean, what has it been like being with the Freedom to Read Foundation and the Office of Intellectual Freedom? What has it been like this past year? Like, um, this the stress level. Just what could you, what do you want to tell us about that? Um, our director Deborah Caldwell Stone um, is an attorney by vocation, and then she worked in the OIF uh, as the main legislative and legal lead for years and she speaks so eloquently about these issues. And one thing that has changed for her, uh, especially during the pandemic. So keep in mind, much of this has been going on while we have been in stay at home mode. We aren't working in our offices. We're not running around collaborating within ALA you know, groups as much. She has been tirelessly answering questions with the press and getting the word out there. She's been presenting and training across the country. But the biggest thing, um, so we have uh, one of my colleagues it, like I said, it used to be a couple times a month, you'd get a challenge report. And we have a large database where we enter all the information. One of my colleagues is now doing that as their job. Just maintaining that database part time, I should note. Um, but she has taken over, you know, handling the database. And Deborah and Kristen Picole, the assistant director of the ALA Office for Intellectual Freedom, have gone from working with committees or working with different pop projects across the country, like the Intellectual Freedom Manual or other things. They've gone from that to being 40 to 60 hours a week support staff. I mean, truly, they are spending all of their time talking with um, librarians across the country, helping support them and explain what they can do to prevent challenges, um, collaborating with other organizations and library schools and state intellectual freedom committees on training. Um, and there have been a few times when I've just wanted to sit down and cry because I've never seen anything like it. My background is in journalism. And then my second degree is library information science. 
And I never, ever envisioned a world where I would have any form of job security or where people would look at my field in a negative way. I've always viewed journalists and librarians as people that provide access to information and, and build bridges. We help bridge people's information gaps. And now we're just doing that with a different focus. Well, thank you very much for your work. And it is just mind boggling to me that we live in a world where librarians are seen as the enemy. It just doesn't make any sense. And I worry that did these people not get taken to the library as children? Do they not, like what, where's the disconnect that you can live in a world where you think, you know, middle school librarians are peddling in porn. You met a middle school librarian, they're wonderful people. You know, just, it's a very, very strange upside down kind of time. And, and um, so I appreciate the work you all are all doing and trying to make sure kids have access to books that are affirming and supporting librarians and teachers and administrators in this crazy time. Yeah. Well, and thank you to all of you for the work you're doing. This seems like a really important group. Uh, when we sign off tonight, I'm going to send a couple of people um, information about your organization. Uh, they both work with um, one of my friends, uh, Aaron Hollingsworth, is a librarian in rural Alaska, um, and she works with people who don't have access to technology. So that's another really critical uh, piece of it is making sure students have access to that. So, so I'll let her know about this group. I think it would be a good fit. So. Thank you for having me. I, I get the impression we're le we're uh, over time here. So I think so. I think so. And I, it sounds like Molly's not here to uh, okay to wrap it all up. So I have to go. So okay, I, it's been really really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a good Bye. night. Bye.